And uh, today, I'm actually, I'm especially pleased because uh, we have another guest from USA, a guest that uh, is a very esteemed scholar uh, of uh, very, very American uh, philosophy. And I'm also pleased that uh, the one who prepared and uh, who will moderate this event is none other than our previous uh, president, Dr. Tomasz Grushoni. So again, this, this would be just my usual hello. And uh, right now I will just give the words to Dr. Grushonik and uh, of course to Professor. Uh, yes, thank you, Gospet. Uh, so first of all, I would like to welcome you all. Uh, today's guest is uh, Professor Russell Brian Goodman. He's the Emeritus uh, Regents Professor at the University of New Mexico. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting the professor while I was on my Fulbright in uh, New Mexico, and he was my supervisor, and that was a wonderful experience that actually resulted in uh, more than a decade-long collaboration. So uh, I'm very happy, Professor, that uh, you uh, responded to our invitation and that you are here uh, today. So uh, Professor Stock uh, has a title. It's called Cavell and the Transcendentalists uh, from Juilliard to Walden and Beyond. And um, I think it's a very suitable title uh, because the whole idea of this talk is to actually introduce Slovenian public to a, a very uh, fruitful and yet uh, not very well uh, known tradition in uh, Slovenia or in Central Europe for that matter, I think, which is really a pity. And that's a transcendentalist tradition of American philosophy on the one hand, and then on the other hand, also a philosophy of Stanley Cavell, uh, who is, I think, also responsible for reinvigorating reading of uh, uh, transcendentalists in American philosophical tradition itself. So uh, I won't be too long, but I do want to mention uh, 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 four uh, books that uh, Professor Goodman uh, prepared. And um, one of his earliest works is um, uh, uh, his um, uh, a book on American philosophy and the Romantic tradition, um, on which Professor is working now for a long time. But that book actually also deals with uh, James and Dewey and kind of provides a Cavalian reading of those authors, which I think is really, uh, really a, a novelty and it's a really interesting work. Uh, then, uh, not so long ago, uh, maybe four years ago, Professor published another really exciting book, American Philosophy Before Pragmatism, uh, which deals with Emerson and uh, Thoreau, but also with Edwards and other figures that are even less known uh, in Slovenia, a really interesting reading. But then also a professor um, uh, compiled a collection of papers on Cavell with the title Contending with Stanley Cavell that, Cavell, that was published in 2005 by Oxford University Press. Uh, and uh, also one of his books that was very intriguing to me, and that is actually how I uh, first came in contact with Professor, is his uh, monograph on Wittgenstein and William James, where he actually speaks about uh, the influence of William James on Wittgenstein, which is really an, also an important topic. Um, professor is also author of several entries in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, for instance, Emerson Transcendentalists, William James, an author of numerous other uh, uh, papers and book chapters, and I won't even go into that because I, I would cast a shadow on today's guest. So without further ado, uh, Professor, welcome. We are thrilled to have you uh, uh, to deliver a talk for us, and um, the, the, the Zoom and the Facebook are all yours. Thank you very much, Tomas, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to uh, do some philosophy with you and to reconnect with Slovenia. Um, just hearing that wonderful introduction, I'm remembering how good an expositor uh, Tomas is of uh, philosophy, and I remember uh, 
an account you gave of Wittgenstein in one of my classes that was really very illuminating for, for all of us. So I'm um, glad to see you uh, doing so well. Um, yeah, the, I was remembering that uh, there was a review of Wittgenstein and William James by, by the Wittgenstein scholar Newton Garver. And he kept saying, or maybe I heard, maybe he was doing this at the APA in a, in a meeting, but he kept saying, this is a chronicle. Goodman is providing a chronicle, a kind of uh, account of, of events in time uh, of, the, of Wittgenstein's engagement with William James. And yes, it is that among other things. And I think I only bring that up because I think this paper is also um, in many ways a chronicle of uh, the events in Stanley Cabell's life that led him to write about the transcendentalists, a very unpredictable movement, I'd say. So here we go. It should fit into your time limits so we have time to uh, discuss. And once again, there is a handout available with all, uh, yeah. So Stanley Cavell speaks of having public, and if I'm not coming across clearly, please let me know. Cavell speaks of having published a trio of books around 1970. Must We Mean What We Say was one of them. Second one, The World Viewed, Reflections on the Ontology of Film. And the third book, The Senses of Walden. The first of these books, Must We Mean What We Say, contains a series of philosophical essays on Wittgenstein, Austin, the workings of ordinary language, and our knowledge of other people. But it all, little did I know. He calls that book, quote, a largest collection of mostly or intermittently recognizable philosophical essays, unquote. The film book and the Walden books were even more extraordinary publications for a philosopher, especially at Harvard in 1970, Harvard, the department of Quine and Robert Nozick and so on. Uh, in his autobiography and about thinking about his writing of these books, Cavell said, good thing I had tenure. So his interest in film, which he began to write about after he got tenure, um, reaches back to his time in New York after graduating from Berkeley in 1947. Cavell was, was a music major at Berkeley and he was studying, he was a pianist and also played jazz saxophone um, in California. He was studying composition at Juilliard in New York, but discovering that he was more interested in Freud and film than in his official studies of music. Within weeks of arriving in New York and going to Juilliard, he decided that he would not get a degree from Juilliard, although he continued to attend classes for a while. Quote, I think I have this one on your sheet. I mostly sat in Juilliard's cafeteria on winter mornings, reading Freud, nursing cups of coffee and writing disconsolately in a journal. Cavell reports, abandoning the cover of Juilliard, I would read all day and then about eight or nine at night get cleaned up and take the double A line to Times Square for a meal at a coffee shop and afterward find a late film, often on 42nd Street where the rows of former so-called legitimate Broadway theaters running between 6th and 8th Avenues were around 1948, the sites of reruns of Hollywood talkies. It's a long Cavellian sentence. We know some sources, some then, some indications of interest for two of Cavell's trio of books in the years 1969 to 72. We know he was watching film, we know he was reading Freud and other sort of modernist writers. But what of Thoreau and specifically of Walden? There's a little hint in Cavell's discussion of his dis what he calls his disentanglement from music, what he calls the undoing of its place in his life. He writes in the autobiography, an image for the undoing, as I pick up the thread now, is a passage from the opening chapter of Walden that I have had occasion to return to more than once since rereading since re the book in 1968, in which Thoreau declares, our molting season 
like that of the fowls, must be a crisis in our lives, unquote. Well, Cavell's molting season, his vocational, crisis, vocational crisis, musician, psychologist, philosopher, is the main point of this sentence. But for our purposes, the verb rereading and the date are key. He's rereading Walden in 1968. The image that he uses from Walden to describe his 1948 crisis in New York became available to him only upon his rereading Walden in 1968 four years before he published his book, The Census of Walden. So why was Cavell rereading Walden? And when were his earlier readings of that book? I take up the second question first and postpone the question about 1968 till the next section. So first, when did he first read Walden? We learned something about an earlier read reading of Walden in the 1940s when he was in college from a passage in Cavell's breakout romanticism book called In Quest of the Ordinary, Lines of Skepticism and Romanticism. In the book's second chapter, originally delivered as a lecture at Berkeley, Cavell, write, Cavell writes this, and I have this in your handout. So here's Cavell, 1968, no, 88 or 87 at Berkeley, where he was undergraduate, now he's a Harvard professor, coming back. And he says this, it's hard for me coming from the Harvard philosophy department to lecture at Berkeley on subjects in romanticism and skepticism to put aside a discussion of Santayana's fantastically influential essay named and naming the genteel tradition in American philosophy. That lecture was delivered at Berkeley a little over 70 years ago by a man, Santayana, who was living in Boston during the last 10 years of Cavell's life, and who at Harvard had been the most glamorous teacher of one who would be my glamorous teacher of Walden when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley halfway back those 70 odd years. That's quite a mouthful. The main point that Cavell is about to deliver concerns Santayana's role in what he thinks of as the repression of Emerson. There's a whole line in Cavell about Emerson and Thoreau being repressed by American culture and American philosophy. And Santayana with his idea of the genteel tradition is part, Cavell thinks, of that repression. Uh, in his essay on the genteel tradition in American philosophy, uh, Santayana writes that Emerson was a cheery, childlike soul impervious to the evidence of evil. That's a rather condescending and actually inaccurate uh, depiction of Emerson. But I'm not interested in that right now. I'm interested in him, his, in Cavell's reference to his glamorous teacher of Walden back when he was um, an undergraduate. So who is this glamorous teacher of Walden? He drops this little statement about a glamorous teacher of Walden without mentioning the guy's name. But when the essay, uh, this essay was republished in uh, Emerson's Transcendental Etudes, which is a collection of all of Cavell's work on uh, Emerson. A footnote identifies this glamorous teacher of Walden as Benjamin Harrison Lehman, a longtime professor of English and, and founder of the Department of Dramatic Arts at Berkeley. And I go on in this paper to talk a little bit about this guy. I looked up his bio, he is famous for a paper uh, called The Doctrine of Leadership in the Greater Romantic Poets, um, con considers the political importance of poetry and the poet by examining works of Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, and Keats. So Cavell had a glamorous teacher of Walden who was a student of the Romantic poets and that's some background for his later interest in Romanticism but I found no evidence that Lehman wrote about Thoreau or Anderson as opposed to teaching them or that Cavell studied Coleridge or any of the British poets with him. Still, Lehman's idea or transmission of the idea that poets are leaders of society anticipates Cavell's readings of Thoreau and Emerson as engaged in founding a new nation. Okay, um, a little bit more about Benjamin Harrison Lehman. 
Apart from the footnote I've mentioned, Lehman's name appears just once in a text of Cavell's in the autobiography of him, Little Did I Know. The context is Morton White's invitation to Cavell, who was then a student of philosophy at Berkeley, to apply to the Harvard PhD program. Um, and Cavell was discussing what he knew about Harvard. Quote from Cavell in Little Did I Know. I remembered Benjamin Lehman, a glamorous teacher from the English department in my undergraduate years at Berkeley, telling one of those stories expatriated Harvard graduates like to tell to convey to the less fortunate about the unraveled, unrivaled swank of Harvard. The story is rather a sour one, so I won't repeat it here, but I've been curious enough about the re repetition of the word glamorous in his discussions of language. <laughs> spent vacations in New York going to the theater, that he married the British actress Judith Anderson and published a novel called Wild Marriage in 1925. And then I won't read this also, but you'll find on your handout a tribute to Lehman, who apparently was, had a wonderful voice and wore these rather fancy rings um, and was a, clearly a memorable teacher. So that's the glamorous teacher of Walden, ring and all, what did Cavell learn from this man? I don't know. Perhaps only, but importantly, as my friend David La Roca suggested to me, at least to take the book Walden seriously. So he first read it as an undergraduate. It disappeared from his philosophical corpus, but it was in the back of his mind when he reread it in 1968. And so second, part of the paper really, why was Cavell reading Walden or rereading Walden in 1968? There are two sets of reasons here. One set has to do with American politics and culture. The other is epistemological and ontological, overlapping Cavell's discussions of knowing and acknowledging in Must We Mean What We Say and in the evolving fourth part of the claim of reason, still nine years away from publication. So taking American culture first, 1968, Cavell was asked to teach in a Harvard summer program called the International Seminar, founded and directed by Henry Kissinger, of all people, professor of politics at Harvard, with the aim of introducing young leaders from around the world to the best of American culture. Morton White, longtime professor of Harvard, actually a student of pragmatism, had taught the humanities portion of, of the program in the 1960s, and he recommended Cavell to Kissinger in 1968. In that year, in the succeeding summer, Cavell taught Thoreau's Walden, among other texts. Um, and I based that information on an article that I was led to by Cavell's widow, Kathleen, um, an account of the seminar in the Harvard Crimson, and also reminiscences, reminiscences of, of Mrs. Cavell. So that's American culture. As for politics, 1968, as you all know, was a turbulent year around the world in Paris, Prague, Mexico City, Chicago, Washington, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, among many other places. With the assassinations of Martin Luther King and, Martin, and Robert Kennedy, excuse me, mass protests and police riots America seemed to be tearing itself apart, as well as destroying much of Vietnam in a war that no one seemed able to end. Cavell inscribes a mark of this historical moment in an anguished passage at the end of his essay, The Avoidance of Love, a reading of King Lear. That's the one that was the last essay in Must We Mean What We Say. He connects major themes of the essay, such as doubt, failure to acknowledge, desire for and avoidance of love with the Vietnam War, the resistance to it, and the resistance to that resistance. This marks the first place in print, so far as I am aware, where Cavell raises the question of America. Cavell doesn't start as an American philosopher at all, but rather as an interpretation of I don't know, Wittgenstein and Austin. So in this anguished portion at the end of his long essay on King Lear, Cavell argues that America was discovered, he writes, America was discovered, and what was discovered was not a place, 
one among others, but a setting, the backdrop of a destiny. But he continues, America has never been assured that it will survive. And its presence, as he goes on, is continuously ridiculed by the fantastic promise of its origin and its possibility. It is the need for love as proof of its existence, which makes America so frighteningly destructive. Enraged by ingratitude and by attention to its promises rather than to its promise. Incapable of seeing that it is destructive and frightening. It imagines its evils to come from outside. So it is killing itself and killing another country in order not to admit its helplessness in the face of suffering in order not to acknowledge its separateness. So here we have America as King Leo, fearful, lost, unable to acknowledge real love, falling for the self-interested and avaricious, avoiding those who really love him. The Lear essay Cabela marked some 40 years later in his autobiography, quote, is in effect a meditation on the failure of politics on the insufficiency of love and loyalty when government has itself become pointedly irrational. So what Cavell calls the avoidance of love or avoidance of acknowledgement is the fatal tragic flaw at the center of the play. And he's arguing in some way at the center of the Vietnam War. So must we, 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 must we mean what we say was republished in 2002 um, and in the republication, Cavell writes uh, a substantial preface where he highlights the political context in which the book was published. Quote, I received my first copy of the book from its publisher on the day of what I recall as the most tortured of the emergency faculty meetings following the massive arrest of students occupying the main administration building of Harvard College in April of 1969 so that my initial joy or its expression in perceiving the book's existence in the world was largely put aside. He returns to this moment and this remark a year later, 2003, in the autobiography, several pages from the occupation of University Hall, quote, the climax at Harvard of the student movement of protest against our war in Vietnam. So the book, The Senses of Walden, which he was preparing or conceiving in the years 1968 and 1969 is, a, is many things. It's a short book, but it's many things. It's a book about language and being, about reading and sitting, building and the economy of life. But it is also a political book that places Thoreau in the context of Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau and other political philosophers. As Cavell notes in the senses of Walden, Thoreau identifies himself as the author of resistance to civil government, also known as civil disobedience, in Walden, in the chapter of Walden called The Village. And Cavell takes the opportunity of writing his book, The Senses of Walden, which is not basically a book about politics. Cavell takes the opportunity to inc incorporate portions of that essay, Civil Disobedience, into his book. For example, this is from Thoreau's essay, Civil Disobedience, but it appears in the senses of Walden, quote, how does, it become a how does it become a man to behave toward this American government today? I answer, this is Thoreau, that he cannot without disgrace be associated with it. I cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government, which is the slave's government also. But that, that disgrace, Cavell notes, is hard to avoid for Thoreau and for any American citizen. After Thoreau's night in jail for refusing to pay his taxes on the grounds that they would support the American war with Mexico, Thoreau realizes that however separate from the state he would like to be, he is entangled with it. He is, as Cavell says, disgraced. As things stand, Cavell concludes, one cannot but choose to serve the state. So he, Thoreau, will serve the state with his conscience also, and so necessarily resist it for the most part. That's from the census of Walden. 
for Thoreau and Emerson, as Cabell was later to appreciate. And now again, quoting from the census of Walden, America's revolution never happened. It was not a war of independence that was won because we are not free. So when Thoreau takes up residence in his cabin, he is experimenting with a new America and new forms of freedom with an economy based on necessities like food, clothing, and shelter, but not on extraneous pleasures and schemes of, of torment like debt. Most of his contemporaries, Thoreau maintains, in a passage quoted by Cavell, are slave drivers of themselves who suffer unrelenting, self-imposed torments, unquote. It's not from society as such that Thoreau declares his independence, Cavell points out, for Walden is riddled with the doings of society. It, is, it isn't exactly a, de a declaration of Indy's beliefs and values either, but rather, Cavell writes, at least independence from the way society practices those beliefs and values. Something that Cavell points out the original colonists had in mind. So those young American citizens at Harvard and elsewhere who declared their independence in the late 60s were doing so to redeem America, to call it to account with itself, not to separate from it. So it's not hard to see some connections between the protests of the late 60s and the political philosophy of Thoreau's Walden. But these are not connections, as I've already mentioned, that Cavell advertises in the senses of Walden. There is, however, a potent remark, again, in the autobiography, little did I know, that connects Walden with Cavell's own political engagement, not in 1969, but earlier in the summer of 1964, the summer of what we in America call the Freedom Rides, when people were going down to the segregated South and when white people were going down um, and integrating places that were, along with black people, integrating places that were from one race or another. So Cavell was down in Mississippi in something called the Freedom Summer Project in 1964. Uh, specifically, he writes at Tougaloo College, a small black college outside Jackson, Mississippi, unquote, which he visited along with a group of mainly Harvard graduate students. Cavell, who was an assistant professor at the time, I think, lectured, showed a film, gave a concert he played, and discussed philosophy. He draws the connection with this venture, with the summer of 64, when he writes in, in the autobiography. I shall just note here my conviction that had I not spent those weeks in Tougaloo, I would not have claimed the right several years later to speak for Thoreau's Walden. And if I had not recognized Walden as a work of philosophy claiming to speak for me, I would not have felt bound or been interested to claim the right to speak for it." Unquote. So that's Cavell in 2010. Um, and in the background with this idea of who has the right to speak, uh, or the authority to speak for whom, and whether and how to exercise the right to speak for oneself, like Cavell's works in such later books. There's a pitch of philosophy, a book about film, Contesting Tears, and then all his writing on Emerson. On Emerson. I, I obviously don't have the, the time to discuss these ideas in any detail, but in anticipation of section five below, I just want to point out that the quotation above draws on Cabral's theory of reading as a philosophical method that requires the discovery of which texts speak for us and hence allows us to speak for them, to say something of our own with their aid. The writer, Cabral states in a passage along these lines in the senses of Walden, the writer lets words come to him from their own region and then takes that occasion for inflecting them one way or another or from refraining from them then and there, as one may inflect the earth towards beans or instead of glass. Okay, how am I doing on time, Tomas? Um, I think we are fine. I think you are not speaking more than maybe 20 minutes, so. Good, okay, good. I'm about halfway through. Third section, 
we've gone from the politics and American culture and from Juilliard uh, now to the third section is called Walden's Epistemology and Metaphysics. According to Cavell in the census of Walden. So Cavell treats Walden as a work of political philosophy as we have seen, but he also teases at Kantian structures of the work and uses portion of, portions of it in his thinking about strengths and inadequacy in what he calls the Kantian settlement. I think just thinking about early Cavell, uh, maybe those four, yeah, the subtitle of The Claim of Reason, which wasn't his first book published, but is some of his earliest work. The subtitle is Wittgenstein, Skepticism, Morality, and Tragedy. Um, and that King Lear is the tragedy and, and Othello. Um, but Kant could be in there too. Cavell, Kant is really important for Cavell. Um, he basically um, discovers the Kantian strains in Wittgenstein's philosophy. That's a whole other story. Um, but he's always finding Kant. <laughs> he's often finding Kant in, in people he reads in, in Thoreau and especially later in Emerson. Um, and he taught the course of Kant at Harvard for many years. So the Kantian settlement, what is the Kantian settlement? That settlement holds that we have knowledge of an, object, of an ab objective world apart from us in space and time, but that this world that we are equipped to know so well is phenomenal, a set of appearances rather than things as they are in themselves. So about this settlement, you can know objects that are apart from you in space and time, but they're all only appearances. About this settlement, Cavell writes, um, in, in, a, in another essay, thanks for nothing. Ironic, that's not satisfying to me. Thanks for nothing. That's his essay, Emerson Coleridge Kant. So, in a, um, so there's a just he's fascination and a dissatisfaction with Kant in the background here. In a key passage from Walden, Thoreau writes of this, and I have this on your sheet. He writes about nature, the arching and sheaf-like top of the wool grass that he sees on a winter rock, walk. It is, Thoreau writes, among the forms which art loves to copy and which in the ve vegetable kingdom have the same relation to types already in the mind of man that astronomy has. Cavell calls attention to the Kantian resonance of the word forms and the expression types already in the mind the mind of man in this passage, and argues that Cavell expands our necessary or a priori knowledge of the world beyond space, time, objects, and causality. Quote from Cavell, human forms of feeling, objects of human attraction, our reactions constituted in art are as universal and necessary, as objective, as revelatory of the world, as the forms of the laws of physics. We find here in this paragraph, the sentence, an anticipation of Cavell's later claim that L. Emerson also develops a larger list of categories than does Kant. In the essay, in the Emersonian essay called Experience, Cavell argues, these categories are called the lords of life and they include Kantian sound, sounding forms like succession, moral categories like wrong, metaphysical sounding categories like reality and illusion, and ca categories more obviously reflecting our humanity, such as use, surprise, and temperament. These, these lords or categories, Cavell writes, govern not the objects of the world, as in the critique of pure reason, but the world as a whole. So he makes a distinction between the world as a whole which is something that is also revealed by moods and objects of the world, which is something that's revealed by categories like, well, categories of objects. Um, so returning now to the senses of Walden, 
Cavell finds in Thoreau not only the use, but also a critique of the Kantian idea that the world we know through the categories is phenomenal, limited to appearances. As Cavell, and Cavell states his idea in a long speculative footnote um, of the senses of Walden, which I reproduce here. Walden, he writes, provides a transcendental deduction, a transcendental deduction of the category of the thing in itself. For Kant, this would be impossible because we have no knowledge of things as they are in themselves. And a transcendental deduction is designed to show that some form of a priori knowledge like physics or geometry is legitimate. But what Kant leaves out, Cavell asserts, is the basic externality of the world. Quote, when I said that Kant ought to have provided a deduction of the thing in itself, I meant that he had left unarticulated an essential feature or category of objectivity itself. Specifically, that a world apart from me in which objects, that of a world apart from me in which objects are met. The externality of the world is articulated by Thoreau as its nextness, as its nextness to me. So let me just summarize where we've gone a little bit. Um, Thoreau finds the, the Kantian settlement dis, unsatisfactory because it leaves us detached somehow from the thing in itself. Um, he is going to have a reading of the senses of Walden uh, as in some way giving a derivation of or um, explaining or justifying the legitimacy of the idea of a thing in itself. Um, and how does he do that? Um, he does that through a category that Cavell calls neighboring, getting near to. And those of you who know Heidegger, or probably all of you know that the, the near and the neighbor are Heideggerian concepts and terms. And so one of the things going on here, I'm departing from the paper, but not from the thinking here, Cavell, well, I'll come to this again. Cavell's reading Heidegger at the same time and thinking about nearness and then reading Cavell about nearness. So here's, and then reading Thoreau about nearness. So here's a passage from the book Walden. This is Thoreau. Nearest to all things is that power which fashions their being. Next to us, I have some typos here. Next to us, the grandest laws are continually being executed. Next to us is not the workman whom we have hired, with whom we love to so well to talk, but the workman whose work we are, unquote. So Cavell picks up the threads connecting what we are next or near to and Thoreau's account of, quote, finding himself suddenly neighbor to the birds and calls this a phenomenological description of finding the self. So is he finding nature or is he finding the self? I think both together. So Cavell, he says this, our relation to nature at its best would be that of neighboring, knowing the grandest laws it is executing while nevertheless, quote, not wholly involved in them. That's something Thoreau says. Thoreau, Thoreau in Walden, we might say, provides a phenomenology of neighboring. We can be near or far from ourselves, from the birds, from nature generally. So for example, in his chapter on solitude, Thoreau talks about a kind of society with nature, writing that, this is Thoreau, quoted in Cavell's book, he suddenly, so this is Thoreau, he suddenly, he, sorry, he sometimes experienced that the most sweet and tender, the most innocent and encouraging society may be found in any natural object. I was suddenly sensible of such sweet and beneficent society in nature, an infinite and account unaccountable friendliness all at once, like an atmosphere sustaining me, has made the fancy, fancied advantage of human neighborhood insignificant, and I've never thought of them since. That's Thoreau. Rather typical of Thoreau to not really want to be around people so much. Um, 
So when he comes to study Emerson seriously in the late 1970s, just to go back to dates, Senses of Walden is published in 1971. At the end of the 70s, after he finishes the claim of reason, really, or as he's finishing it, um, Cavell finds a new term for Thoreau's neighboring, and that term is reception. As in Emerson's claim at the end of his experience essay that all I know is reception. I am and I have, but I do not get. And when I fancied I'd gotten anything I found I did not. Reception in Emerson is often paired with surprise and with the lack of an active synthesizing will, both in Thoreau and in Emerson. In thinking of Emerson, an essay Thoreau wrote, published 78, 79, um, Cavell, he published it in the expanded edition of The Senses of Walden. Cavell cites this passage from Emerson, from the essay Intellect. Emerson writes, you cannot, with your best deliberation and heed, come so close to any question as your spontaneous glance shall bring you, whilst you rise from your bed or walk abroad in the morning after meditating the matter before sleep on the previous night. Our thinking, Emerson writes, is a pious reception. Our truth of thought is therefore vitiated as much by too violent direction given by our will as by too great negligence. So reading the later works of Heidegger at just this period, Cavell is struck by the congruence of Emerson's thinking is a pious reception and Heidegger's questioning is the piety of thinking. He takes a cue from a foot, footnote in the American philosophy professor James G. Hart's collection of essays by Heidegger called The Piety of Thinking, in which Hart becomes one of the few people to pay any attention to the senses of Walden in its initial years after being published. And Hart, in, a, in his book on Heidegger, The Piety of Thinking, has this footnote in which he says, I find Cavell's little work, The Senses of Walden, to be in part a beautiful explication of Heidegger's notion of poetic dwelling and his meditations on Holderman, unquote. Cavell had con conducted a graduate seminar on being in time in the fall of 1964, soon after its translation to, into English. But in the, in the late seventies, he was reading something else. He was reading what is called thinking and the remarkable essay, building, dwelling, thinking, whose verbs just about cover Thoreau's most, most important activities. Cavell finds in the idea of thinking as a pious reception, a solution to the problem of skepticism, or better, a way of containing and employing the skepticism he wrestles with in his studies of Wittgenstein, Austin, and Shakespeare. The idea of thinking as reception, Cavell writes, seems to me to be a sound intuition, specifically to forward the correct answer to skepticism, which Emerson meant it to do. The answer does not consist in denying the conclusion of skepticism, but in reconceiving its truth. It is true that we do not know the existence of the world with certainty. Our relation to its existence is deeper, one in which it is accepted, that is to say, received, unquote, Cavell from the senses of Walden. So Emerson and Thoreau, Cavell argues, work in this territory of reception and intimacy with the world, territory that forms the basis for the ordinary language philosophy of Austin and Wittgenstein, Cavell argues, but which they do not explicate. 10 years after publishing his first article on Emerson, thinking of Emerson, and at the end of a decade in which he published six major essays on Wittgenstein, that's the decade of, sorry, six major essays on Emerson, yes, the eighties, Cavell returns to this point in his essay entitled, Finding as Founding, Taking Steps in Emerson's Experience. So I'll read this. Um, and I guess like all of us, uh, Cavell is trying to make some kind of coherent whole out of his philosophy and, um, here he is, um, it may be central to this, is the way in which um, 
this exploration of perception and intimacy um, and connection to the world in Emerson and Thoreau, Thoreau in some way underwrite, um, that's Cavell's verb, um, the, the ordinary language philosophy of uh, Austin and Wittgenstein. So here's Cavell from Finding Us Founding. Austin's and Wittgenstein's attack, attacks on philosophy and on skepticism in particular, in appealing to what they call the ordinary or everyday use of words, are counting on some intimacy between language and world that they were never able satisfactorily to give an account of. It was in Emerson and Thoreau that I seemed to find what I could recognize as this space of investigation in their working out of the problematic of the day, the everyday, the near, the low, the common, in conjunction with what they call speaking of necessaries and speaking with necessity. Okay, section four, it's called perfectionism. This is the place, but not the time to discuss ways in which Cavell's interpretation of Thoreau anticipates the Emersonian moral perfection and perfectionism he begins to delineate in the late 80s. And the second part of this paper is about moral perfectionism uh, of the Emersonian uh, sort. But Walden also is a perfectionist work. Um, Cavell, you hear this perfectionist um, interpretation of it in Cavell's claim that the task of Walden as a whole is to discover how to earn and spend our most wakeful hours, whatever we are doing. And to his remark that the fate of having a self, of being human, is one in which the self is always to be found, fated to be sought or not, recognized or sought or not. Thoreau's Descriptions emphasize that this having a self is a continuous activity. Among Thoreau's perfectionist pronouncements, one that springs to mind is this from his Higher Laws chapter, quote, every man is the builder of a temple called his body to the God he worships after a style purely his own, nor can he get off by hammering marble instead. We are all sculptors and painters, and our material is our own flesh and blood and bones. Whether like Emerson Thoreau thinks of himself as abandoning his old self, and whether he thinks of his deepest self are part of, part of some intelligence or oversoul in which it rests, are two issues worth further discussion. But I won't do that here. So just the last uh, section here. Cavell's method, reading. In his essay called The Philosopher in American Life, published in, in Quest of the Ordinary in 1988, Cavell re responds to the charge that Walden cannot be a philosophical work because it contains no arguments. Arguments, however, are a way, Cavell writes, of accepting responsibility for one's discourse. There is another philosophical way of accepting responsibility for your discourse. He calls this reading. Such a conception of philosophical method with its own conceptions of rigor is to be found in continental philosophy, Cavell acknowledges. Quote, according to the thought that philosophy may be inherited either as a set of problems to be solved as Anglo-American analysts do or else as a set of texts to be read as Europe does, except of course, where it is accepted or re-accepted analysis. Emerson and Thoreau differ from the European philosophers, however, Cavell writes, in not claiming to have read everything. That's like all of you. We, we Americans think, boy, you've read everything. Um, I've read nothing. Um, <laughs> the, <clears throat> the Americans don't do that, especially Emerson and Thoreau, though they read a lot. Um, they're more like Socrates in this respect, Cavell observes, than like Plato. The transcendentalists, Emerson and Thoreau, also differ from many philosophers in both traditions in understanding that practicing philosophy does not require special attention to philosophical texts or to any texts at all. 
quote. While philosophizing is a product of reading, the reading in question is not especially of books, especially not of what we think of, book, of, books, as of books of philosophy. The reading is of whatever is before you, unquote. So this approach coheres with the transcendentalist interests in the ancient philosophies of Greece, India, and China. Thoreau's book Walden has a chapter simply called Reading, which plays a major role, not only in Cavell's interpretation of the book, a role I've largely ignored till now, but in forming Cavell's conception of reading as a philosophical method. Thoreau distinguishes what he calls reading in a high sense from ordinary reading, and he distinguishes certain texts that support that reading, which he calls the classics. Thoreau's intention, it seems clear, is to produce such a classic, so that what he builds at Walden is not just the cabin and not only a certain kind of life, but what he calls that choicest of relics, a book whose life will surpass his own. That book, like all classics, requires us, Thoreau says, to stand on tiptoe to read and devote our most alert and wakeful hours to. It requires, as Cavell writes, us to become a seer with it. So this is the method Cavell practices when he becomes a seer with Wittgenstein, looking over his shoulder at Kant and Freud, when he reads Wittgenstein with Nietzsche and Heidegger, when he finds that King Lear offers instruction about the problem of other minds, or reads the curtain in a motel in the movie It Happened One Night as the divide between the phenomenal and the noumenal. Walden, last paragraph here, Walden and then for about 40 years, Emerson's essays provide arenas for Cavell's work on language, self, knowledge, democracy, and philosophical method. In a passage that Cavell quotes in The Philosopher in American Life, Thoreau states that heroic books will always be in a language dead to degenerate times. Cavell gives new life to Walden, a heroic book, and the other heroic books that he reads, allowing them to attract and provoke us, showing us the life they have had all along. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Goodman. So we have a um, uh, quite a lot uh, guests, and I'm sure uh, they have questions. Um, for instance, I know that Professor Darko Strain, I think he met Cavell personally in Netherlands, if I'm not wrong, uh, somewhere in the previous uh, decades. And uh, so uh, maybe, and uh, together with uh, Darko, we organized uh, screenings of uh, Ka Kavalian movies uh, in, uh, in collaboration with Slovenian, um, basically, Kinoteka, like a professional, yeah. So maybe, uh, Darko, if you have any um, comments. Oh, um, I would first of all say that I, I'm really grateful for, 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 for this presentation because it it is, I think it is um, important to hear something about Cavell from the American professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because, um, uh, well, Cavell was, when I met him in Amsterdam in 1998, he was the guest of so-called Spinoza lectures uh, at the Amsterdam University. Yes. And um, well, he uh, he was presented as a theorist of uh, skepticism, uh, uh, Wittgenstein, and uh, all this. Uh, but at the same time, he was presented as a as a bridge between European and American uh, philosophy. You know, the one who as the one who can speak from the standpoint of American, um, let's say analytical, whatever, philosophy, uh, and, and at the same time, who can understand Heidegger and Derrida and Hegel and so on. Yes. And yes, and that, that was, um, 
uh, and I think he is unique in that sense, you know, because he 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 uh, somehow um, can articulate um, because of his position or his uh, he can articulate something that that is uh, a dialogue between this philosophy, which must be somehow. Uh, brought to light <laughs> and well that's that's uh, just uh, one association but maybe I would just have a, a little anecdote uh, from his visit to Amsterdam uh, and he had a, a, a lecture in which he asked himself then I, I looked whether there is uh, uh, any any quote in his work which which is the same as what he said there at this lecture, but uh, I, I found something cl uh, coming close to that, but not exactly that. And, and he said, well, that, that, that once he asked himself whether it, uh, whether it was possible that the, uh, the, in, the, in the American culture, such such thoughts as in the European philosophy with guys like Hegel and so on yes. were, not, uh, were not thought at all. And, um, and then he said, well, it is, uh, the, 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 the thing is that, that uh, what Hegel and uh, Heidegger and these people thought was thought in the Anglo-American philosophy, in literature, uh, and in film, and yes. uh, but <laughs> but I think he he said that be because uh, because of of his I would say gag that he performed in that lecture, and that was that he compared uh, Hegel to Fred Astaire. <laughs> oh right, <laughs> which was quite entertaining, you know, and uh, he he. Played a clip from from Bandwagon, Minelli's yes. Bandwagon, and it is actually you know the, the, this this sequence uh, that happens in the station in this film, yes, is, is actually a, a philosophy of history at the, at the same time uh, phenomenology and whatever you want and yeah so it, 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 uh, that, that this is my my personal uh, how to say um, um, uh, so, uh, my personal memory of of, of Cavell and uh, and then uh, of course then I also had a little chat with him and uh, then but we discussed mainly melodrama you know because he was yes. uh, he he wrote a magnificent uh, book on on a melodrama uh, and I think he he inscribed his thinking into what uh, in film theory is supposed to be um, um, uh, um, rehabilitation of this 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 very specific uh, film genre, you know. So uh, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, this <laughs> thank so, you for that. Yeah, yeah. So I so I was. Uh, Somewhere, I'm. I, you know, we're both remembering something that Cavell said somewhere, or not, or can't find it in print. But I think, on um, leaving aside the the Fred Astaire Hegel connection, uh, which I don't find all that plausible, um, I think he his view is that um, something like uh, yeah, post post Kantian. Transcendental philosophy, um, something like that, did occur in America, in but not in philosophy departments, but in the writing of Thoreau and Emerson. I mean, that's um, and but without all the transcendental, uh, you know, mechanism. Um, and I think he, um, I mean, that's something. So I think he does think that there is a, well, clearly a, a parallel development. Um, with, I don't know, people like Schelling and um, I, I think Fichte and Schelling more than Hegel maybe, um, in, in Emerson anyway, and then, and then Heidegger, anticipations of Heidegger. Um, 
So I, so that's one of the, his, I think his big theses about the history of philosophy that, that something important takes place in America. But it's also, I'm also, I wanted to respond to the way you started by saying that he was presented as someone who um, could understand and respond to and write from the perspective of the, the so-called continental tradition and the analytic tradition. And I think that's right. And maybe he is unique in being able to do that. Um, uh, he did, I mean, he did get his degree from an analytic department. And um, uh, I remember there's a place where Richard Rorty complains about Cavell that he's too hung up on Kant and too worried about Hume, you know, and get over it, Rorty says, you know, embrace the wider range. So I, at least to some, some sympathetic reader of Cavell, he looks like too much of an analytic philosopher, you know, and, um, right? Um, and, but, and that story, which I think is absolutely right, the story of his sensitivity to the continental and to the American traditions, that story, as it was told to you, and as it can be told, leaves out the American stuff entirely. Um, he, I mean, he, he has so many facets to him, but I think Cabell's a great interpreter of Heidegger, um, and um, which he does, you know, on its own without having reading Emerson. So um, I'll tell you a little anecdote, okay, on this subject when. I don't know if it's still the case, but if you go to the Place de la Sorbonne in Paris and go to the Vran, the academic bookstore that's on one side of it, and you look for Cavell's works, you will find them under the, you know, there's medieval philosophy and I don't know, phenomenology and all these categories. Cavell's works are found under analytic philosophy, <laughs> right? That's what he looks like, at least looked like, you know, at a certain point. Yeah. So thank you for that. Who else? So we have here uh, Andre Ole, I think. Uh, Professor Ole is really a person that worked on Wittgenstein for his whole life. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so Andre. Please. But uh, okay, but I want to speak on Wittgenstein. But I uh, want to ask you about Peirce. About Peirce. Yes, because Peirce was also a part of transcendentalist, and at the same time, also one of the basic fathers of analytic philosophy, because his logical system is was parallel to Frege's, and he uh, is the same logical power in essence. So. But at the same time, he was some panente, so to some type, what is very near to transcend, um, Emerson transcendentalism. So he might be also a co connection. And, and also he took Hegel really very seriously, not only as a kind of la literature, but as theory. But uh, thus I ask yeah. you, what do you mean about the <laughs> first goal? In transcendentalism, on in analytic yeah. philosophy. Yeah. Um, well, um, I actually have something to say about this, but Peirce is, as you know, like um, a whole continent of philosophy, and yes. with you know, so many different parts, yes. so many different aspects. Um, but yeah, in his, if I'm getting the dates right, around 1890. So he wrote. He writes the pragmatism pieces in in 78 and 79, um, fixation of belief and how to make our ideas clear. That's what pragmatists read of Peirce. Um, 10 years later, he goes into the, he has this idealist period and that's when he writes, um, oh, I can't remember the names of the paper. Um, Evolutionary Love, Mm -hmm. that paper and there mm -hmm. are five idealist papers and one of them the name I forget but you're I think you're referring to it opens with him saying something like um and I I've quoted this 
I, I, I quoted this, but I can't remember it exactly, but basically um, I must admit that I, he, Peirce says, I must admit that I grew up in Concord, Massachusetts at the time when Emerson and um, uh, other followers of the, what is his adjective, of the bizarre philosophy of Plotinus and other inheritors of, uh, you know, he, he takes a shot at these people's commitment to idealism, but also says famously that the transcendental virus may have infected him and may show <laughs> up in this work. Um, and, um, and indeed it does. I, don't, I mean, I'm, I've written about this a little bit in uh, the epilogue to my book, um, American Philosophy Before Pragmatism. There's a little bit on Peirce. And I, I, um, I don't know Peirce well enough to find all the places, but I think one, one thing he gets from Emerson is, the, is the, his notion of what an idea is. He, he pretty much, he pretty much um, translates a passage from one of Emerson's essays, I think maybe history, about what an idea is. An idea is a concrete um, existence. It's like a form of life, you might say. An idea has life. It's not just in your head. That's something Emerson says. He talks about the idea of the, uh, Emerson's example is the idea of the um, Gothic cathedral, mm -hmm. which is not an idea that we can have anymore exactly, but it was a live idea in the day. And that notion of a real idea is something that appears in Percy's essays. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, he, he's another, He's another person who's subject to these, you know, you know, who's a pretty important logician, and in that sense, an analytic philosopher, but who's also responding to continental and medieval philosophy. But he doesn't like it so much, you know? It's a virus that he, <laughs> it's a, you know, he's, it's a virus. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, you know, Su Susan <laughs> Hawk, you know, Susan Hawk or Hack, she has some, uh, I forget, um, she's got a couple of essays uh, in which she attacks Peirce, uh, or no, not rather, in which Peirce attacks literary philosophy. Um, something like the pirates on the high seas of literature or something taking over philosophy. So I, I don't think he likes it. He admits he respects Emerson and probably took some things from Emerson. But literary philosophy, which is the way a lot of continental philosophy appears, and certainly the way Cavell appears, he you know, did not like. Though he himself, I mean, I'm just rambling here, but Peirce is one of the great writers, so part of his attraction is his style. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Peirce is. I don't know about the Hegelian influence in Peirce. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. The one, two, three business, or, yeah, you can tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, at least at the beginning of Peirce, uh, he was studying German idealism. Yes. It was from Canton, uh, Hegel. Yes. Uh, there's some threat of Hegelian uh, dialectics are also in Peirce. Because, uh, for example, this uh, Persian trialism uh, in, in Gnostics yes. is, in, in a sense, similar to trialism yes. in Hegel. And he, yes. also, okay. he admits that. <laughs> he admits that. Okay, that's what I don't know, but I'm sure that's right. Yeah. I, his, his semiotic theory, and yeah, it all, it all goes in threes. He really thinks three is a really important philosophical number. Just yeah. like, yes. And, and the end, uh, the end phases of Peirce metaphysical zine was something like uh, panentheism, very special evolutionary panentheism. Uh, uh, this wasn't published at his time, uh, I, as I know. It was only there were papers in the <laughs> for himself, but uh, they are now they are published. They're now available. Yes. Yes, they are Thanks. available. Uh, yeah, well, this, this is really uh, again a virus. <laughs>
Yeah. Occidentalism. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. When I first started writing about the pragmatists and Emerson and the transcendentalists, I basically left Peirce out because I didn't really see it. I was writing about Dewey and James, but one of the readers of my books forced me to consider Peirce and uh, it was a good thing. Um, uh, I think another thing in Peirce that I found that comes out of Emerson or is, I wouldn't say comes out of Emerson, but another theme in Peirce in those, um, in those 18, you know, late 19th century uh, essays and maybe elsewhere. Another theme in Peirce that is important for Emerson is the theme of surprise. Uh, surprise is one of the lords of life in experience. It's one of, it's a, it's a strange thing to be a category, but um, Emerson says life is a series of surprises. And for Peirce, surprise is um, a way in which the objective world presents itself, mm -hmm. the world breaking through your conceptions. Um, so it's a really important epistemological notion, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we have a lot of guests, actually, and I'm very glad that you found time to join us. So we also have some other Wittgenstein scholars with us. Uh, Borut Zerkaunik worked on Tractatus a lot. Maybe if Borut has something to comment. We also have Varya Strein, who also wrote a book on Wittgenstein. We have Boyan Borsner, who actually, uh, he was responsible for translating Kant's Prolegomena into Slovenian. And uh, we have also Marko Ursic, all of, uh, all of my professors. So you are welcome to, uh, to, to uh, comment or ask a, a question. Um, and, but after that, maybe we can go offline, stop recording and just have a chat. So, uh, but even before that, Gosper will make an announcement. So um, please, another question or two or comment. I actually will uh, have a short question because uh, as usually I need to ask something, right? But <laughs> uh, being formally a host, but uh, it, it, of course, um, Cavell uh, for me is also a very interesting author. I remember when, uh, when I once, uh, I think that Tomaj was a reviewer of one of my texts from Kant, political philosophy, and he said, you need to put Cavell in. So, <laughs> so there's definitely a, place for him elsewhere. I, me, um, personally, I actually um, did quite a lot of work on specifically on Austin's uh, ordinary language philosophy, so he's also interesting in my, uh, in that regard. But on the other hand, uh, I've been working much, uh, much more closely with uh, the text from the Pittsburgh School. Currently, we're also in touch with uh, Robert Brandom, and of course, his uh, very successful, already very success, uh, successful book, uh, Spirit of uh, uh, the, the the spirit of uh, what, what was it? Uh, so uh, was it the spirit of analogy? But but the book on on uh, on on Hegel, you know, that he just published last year, you no, know, it is really kind of a thing that Pittsburgh School is really really popular right now in USA, and especially important in bridging the divide between this continental and another yeah. school. And I'm interested how Cowell would uh, kind of feature in relation to uh, Pittsburgh School, because uh, what was, for example, on McDowell or uh, Brandon, what, what, was he an inspiration or did they have any uh, relations or something? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I th so I thought of Brandon when we were talking about who, who in the American scene or the analytic scene has some real understanding of continental philosophy, and um, Brandon would be a candidate, um, at least, you know, because of his work on Hegel, not on others, and and um, and maybe McDowell, somewhat too. I like both of them. I like McDowell a lot. Um, I have trouble understanding Brandon, um, uh, but you know, they're they're um, they're very different. Um, I mean, and continental philosophy is not just one thing. So I don't think 
I think, uh, I don't think Cavell ever talks about Brandon. Brandon's coming on along a little later and vice versa. I think they're just really, uh, the, the person who could distinguish them and w would have a line about how they are similar and yet very different would be Jim Conant, who you know, knows them I mean, just in conversation, I once had a, what, like a little, a mini lecture from Jim Conant wrapping up Brandom's seven main theses or something. And um, Brandom is someone who believes in arguments. Right. If you want to look at that distinction that Cabell writes, that's one of the real. I mean, he's a great arguer, um, and um, a logic. You know, someone who constructs a logical linkage um, of a, of a system. Cabell reads texts. You know, uh, they're in their method. They're really quite quite different. Another name to bring in here. For, I don't have anything too detailed to talk about. Another person to bring. My internet connection is unstable. Are you losing me? Can you hear me? Can people hear me? Uh, now and then we have a few problems, but it usually uh, you usually come back. So okay, we reconnect. So, yeah. Uh, so another another person to think about who bridges the gap a bit is Richard Rorty. Um, I think Cavell didn't really care for Rorty's, I don't think Cavell cared for Rorty's philosophy very much. Um, I think, and I think Rorty understood Cavell was a pretty important, pretty heavyweight philosopher, but also was frustrated by some of his, uh, you know, commitments to standard analytic philosophy thought he should free himself a little bit um but I, I do remember this so this is a little anecdote um thinking about these two methods in philosophy if they are these the method of reading texts and the method of uh, constructing arguments um there's a, a very good uh, biography of Rorty by a, a sociologist named I think it's Neil Gross, um, quite a good analysis of Rorty's early career, and or maybe his middle career too, because um, there's a letter in it published in there when, when Rorty left Princeton. Rorty was educated at Yale. He actually wrote on, I think he wrote his master's on Peirce there. Um, and, and he was he studied Greek philosophy um, and then was an assistant professor at, and a, a tenured member of the Princeton department where he wrote about uh, philosophy of mind pretty much. I think it was on the Quine, right? If I remember. Um, sorry? I think it was on the Quine, if I remember right. Uh, his district, um, his, his work on philosophy of mind, I think. Uh, maybe. Well, he didn't study with Quine because he didn't go to Harvard. Um, but he, I mean, certainly, yeah, I guess in a way he would, I think he was very much influenced by Quine. Yes. Um, and he was a materialist. Um, um, but when he, when he finally decided to leave Princeton. They tried to keep him, and Neil Gross produces a letter that Rorty wrote, in which he explained that he didn't really feel comfortable anymore in the Princeton department because all his colleagues wanted to do was to construct arguments, and what he wanted to do was to tell stories. And so he really felt he needed to go to another place. Well, telling stories is not the same as reading, as Cavell understands it, but that's a yeah, that's, uh, I think, a deep uh, divide in the method there that Rory was practicing as opposed to what Brandon does. Thank you very much. This was a very comprehensive answer, Professor. It's a good story, isn't it? So, um, we read once, yeah. uh, 
much. I actually read once a very similar story on Rorty's uh, kind of uh, relationship with, with uh, analytic philosophy in his later years and kind of his own story, which really corresponds to all to we've been talking about. But yeah, thank you. So if uh, there are any other uh, questions maybe or comments, Well, uh, today we have a day of anecdotes, and now I'll tell them. <laughs> so this was actually, uh, that's an anecdote by uh, Robert Brandom that he told at the, uh, it was uh, American Philosophical Association uh, Pacific Division Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada. And then somebody asks him something about uh, Rorty, because I think that Rorty actually inaugurated Brandom as his successor. Yes. And then, but he was uh, uh, uneasy with Brandom, actually, that's what Brandom said. And he said, so why are you dealing with those analytic philosophers? Why are you uh, trying to transplant a dead corpse on a living body? Uh, so <laughs> this was uh, Rorty's uh, comment. This is Rorty's comment to his student, Brandom. Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. But uh, in a way, I think that maybe Rorty stayed more uh, analytic. You know, he was always, to my mind, more analytic philosopher than, for instance, Cavell. But I guess it really depends from which perspective you are reading or uh, uh, telling stories or arguing, <laughs> for that matter. Uh, so, okay. Um, thank you very much for being with us.